The title of my message this morning is How to Confess Sins. In our last three sessions, I have stated that we live in a period of Christian history wherein the depth of biblical understanding is so shallow that the solutions to problems are expressed in telling people what to do without the how to do the what to do. Yesterday I gave you the biblical viewpoint on how to, be, to become a born-again Christian. Today, I want to establish the biblical viewpoint on how to confess personal sins. Please note that I said personal sins. This implies that you and I cannot confess sins for another person. In the church age, every human being must stand on his own two feet. Every human being is responsible for his own personal decisions in life, his and his alone. And since the church is not Israel, and Israel is not the church, there is absolutely no biblical evidence that the church-age Christian can beseech God on behalf of a nation and confess national sins so as to move God to forgive that nation, including the USA. This is dispensationally wrong and misses the dispensational hermeneutical viewpoint by a mile. Once again, man has, man has come up with his own viewpoint about confession of personal sins. Some hold the religious viewpoint that confession is made to a human mediator who then grants absolution. Others hold the viewpoint that you wait until the end of the day to confess, wrapping up their sins in a neat daily package while talking to Jesus, just before bedtime. Others just let them pile up and then one day just unload on God. Some hold the, hold the opinion that confession hasn't really taken place unless you feel sorry for your sins. Some even believe that we must ask a God for forgiveness, while others believe that we must beg God for forgiveness. Some would even say that we have not confessed our sins unless we have shown some signs of remorse, such as weeping great drops of tears. Let me be clear. No man has ever received forgiveness by seeking absolution from any other human being, regardless of some ecclesiastical law. No man has ever received forgiveness by letting our daily, weekly, monthly, or annual sins pile up before deciding to confess. No man has ever received forgiveness by feeling sorry for even the most grotesque of sins, or by asking God for forgiveness, or by asking, uh, uh, by begging God for forgiveness, or by showing remorse, or by weeping great drops of tears. And what any one of these methods might appeal to the emotions of man or his ascetic trend. However, none of them will result in forgiveness from God for even the least of one's sins. Why? Because none of these methods are consistent with God's protocol plan for his methods for, uh, for receiving forgiveness for personal sins. How then does one receive forgiveness for personal sins? The answer is based upon what Jesus Christ accomplished on Calvary's cross. In a three-hour period of time, from 12 noon until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus paid the penalty for every sin of every member of the human race, from Adam to the last man who will ever live in human history. His work was so complete on Calvary's cross that he paid the penalty for every sin that every man would ever commit, past, present, and future. Based upon his finished work on Calvary's cross, the following is true. First, the moment an unbeliever places his faith in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation, God the Father immediately and unconditionally forgives every personal sin that that individual has ever committed from birth right up to that moment. Confession of pre-salvation sins is never an issue prior to salvation, only after salvation. Let me be clear. An unbeliever can confess his sins until Jesus comes and not one sin will be forgiven. Why? The issue for an unbeliever is not his personal sins. The issue for him is, what think ye of Christ? Post-salvation sins are the issue for the born-again believer, and 1 John 1, 9 holds the key to personal forgiveness of post-salvation sins. Here it is, pure and simple. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, due to time constraint, I will get right to the biblical point. The word confession in this verse is the Greek word amalageo, that means to name, cite, identify. There it is. 
God's protocol plan, not man's, but God's. Divine revelation says that forgiveness and cleansing is granted by God to any born-again Christian who will name his sins. That's right, name them. You know, Lord, I lied, I cheated, I stole, I committed adultery, I murdered, I... You name it. And God forgives and cleanses from all, A-L-L, -L, all unrighteousness. Man wants to go through all kinds of contortions and perhaps follow up with some act of contrition. The only problem with that is that that is man's viewpoint, not God's. God's grace provision is so simple that most human beings stumble over the simplicity of grace, whether for salvation or forgiveness of post-salvation sins. Don't try to complicate God's plan, brethren. Just follow it. If you have unconfessed sins in your life, just name them and receive your immediate forgiveness and cleansing from whatever you have done. As a final note, confess your sins immediately. Every moment you live with unconfessed sin after salvation determines the time that you remain carnal and out of fellowship with God. Keep short accounts with God. And when you become sick and tired of being sick and tired and confessing the same sin over and over again, God has, yes he has, a solution for you so that you never have to sin again. But that message is for a later date. Until then, name your post-salvation sins to God and receive your immediate forgiveness and cleansing. Father, in Jesus' name, do not allow this message to fall on deaf ears. Amen and amen.